Good morning, United. Yeah, that's great. So uh, it's great to be together. I'm really glad you're here. This is a really cool week because we're starting a new series in a book of the Bible that's really exciting to go through called Daniel. And so if you don't have a Bible, um, it's not too late to get up, grab one on one of these tables, uh, because we don't put the verses on the screen. We want to make sure you can hold it for yourself and see it for yourself in front of you. Uh, If you're not familiar with the Bible, don't worry. I'll tell you what page to turn to, so make sure you grab a Bible. And you can start opening to the book of the Bible called Daniel. If you're not sure where Daniel is in the Bible, we have the page number up here for you. Uh, If you have one of the Bibles on the the side 429 uh, and if you have your own bible that's not one of the blue ones just go ahead and open up to the table of contents no shame in doing that and, and you'll find the page number that daniel's on and we're in the very beginning of that book and you can start to turn there and one of the things that we're going to be keeping in mind as we go through this series called daniel um, it's kind of it's subtitled uh, shining in darkness which comes from daniel 12 3 where it says this and those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above and those turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Daniel is written in a very dark time in Israel's history, which we'll talk about in a second. And sometimes our world can feel very dark, um, but there are glimmers of light. And part of the glimmers of light God sends to this world is through the form of followers of Jesus Christ. We are to be like lights shining in the darkness. And as we go through Daniel, we're going to keep that in mind. Um, And Daniel's a really interesting book um, that one of the things that's unique about it is most of the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament is written by Jewish men, um, but they were often written in the, you know, I guess the comfortability of being in Israel or being at home. Daniel is not written in Israel. It's written in enemy territory. Um, and part of it's actually not written in Hebrew, but it's written in another language, which we'll find. Um, and we're going to just go ahead and start reading together in verse 1. So if you're in Daniel, hopefully by now, I've um, rambled enough for you to turn there. And we're going to read verses 1 through 2 to get us kind of a sense of where we're at in the story. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah... Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. If you've never read through Daniel before, if you've never read through the Bible before, maybe even the Old Testament we're in, you might be completely confused by these details. They might seem unimportant to you, might say, like, how am I supposed to understand where we're at? It reminds me of a time when my family first watched Harry Potter. Do we have any Harry Potter van- fans in here? All right, so what are the, some of the titles of the different Harry Potter series? Just shout them out. Sorcerer's Stone. Say a couple others. Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe is somebody else, but that's close. So... Not a Harry Potter fan there. See, my wife and I, we weren't really big Harry Potter fans. We weren't, like, against it. Um, But we we wanted to see what all the hype was about, and so we went to get uh, the first movie of Harry Potter. Now, because we weren't fans, we didn't know the order of all the different series, and so we grabbed the Chamber of Secrets. So Harry Potter fans are laughing at me right now because it's not the first of the series. And so we started, we threw this in where the family's watching Harry Potter, and we're completely confused. We're like... What's going on? Because there was an assumption that you knew the characters. There was no character development. Um, There was also an assumption that you knew what was going on in the story. We had no idea what was going on in the story as we watched the Chamber of Secrets. We this did not help us in endearing us to Harry Potter by any means. We were so confused by it, and we realized what was going on pretty quickly that this we we got it out of order. Now, similarly to where we're at in Daniel, if you've never read through the Old Testament, if you don't know the story of the Israelites. You'll be really confused. You'll be asking, who's King Jehoiakim and Nebuchadnezzar? Why is he besieging Jehoiakim? You know, what's going on in this story? Now, I'm not going to go back to the very beginning of the Bible to explain the story, which would probably be helpful for for a lot of us to say, like, hey, in Genesis, this is what happens, and it leads us to uh, this time in history where we're at this morning in Daniel. But I will go back enough to make sure all of us know that God had chosen a specific group of people in the world out to call his chosen people. They were called Israelites. 
Um, we call them Jewish people today, or Jews. And the Israelites were led by God. They were chosen by God, and God called them to live in a certain land that was called a promised land. It was a land that was promised to the great patriarchs of Israel. And it was going to be like, almost like the gold rush, getting to this land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. we got to get over there because there's going to be an abundant life for us. And Israel lived in this land. There's a long story about how it took them to get there. We're, we're passing over that. But for 400 years, when they finally entered into the promised land, they got to this land, they lived there for 400 years without a king. They didn't have any king or ruler over them except for God. God was enough for them. But they started comparing themselves to other nations around them that had kings. They were like, hey, we want to be like them. We want to have a king in place. And so they put a king in place. And as you can imagine, as a king comes into power, um, there's power struggles. And over time, there was a civil war that took place in Israel. Maybe you didn't know that. And they were split into two, the north and the south. They didn't have flags, though, um, like America had flags to say, hey, I'm a part of the north and I'm part of the south. Um, but they had, different, they had differences where they were split. And the northern kingdom was called Israel. They lasted for 209 years in this split before they came, became conquered by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom, they stuck around a little bit longer for 325 years. And do you want to guess what king overtook them? Nebuchadnezzar, the verse we just read. All right. And so these people had, God had promised them this land and now all of a sudden they're besieged. But look at verse two, because there's a really interesting detail about this story. It says, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, also all of Judah, into his hand, the whole southern kingdom. Now, I know I gave a really condensed version of Israel's history that doesn't do anything justice, but you have to remember these were God's chosen people that God did miraculous things for and through to get to this promised land. He promised them land, prosperity, safety. And now it seems to say like, it's not just that Nebuchadnezzar did this. It, it's actually the influence of God's sovereign, divine intervention that these Israelites, this Judah, the southern kingdom, is kicked out of the land. Well, one of the things we need to remember, why is this happening, is we go back to the different covenants. We sang a song this morning that said, God of covenant. There's different promises. Covenant means promise that God made to his people throughout history. One of those is a Mosaic covenant. In Exodus 19, it says this. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, this is in the context of the Ten Commandments coming, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. Remember, Israelites were God's special chosen people, but they were instructed, obey my voice, keep my covenant. There's a condition with this covenant. You know, you are faithful to me, I'll be faithful to you. I just finished reading through the book of Joshua. And one of the things that I've learned as I read through the Bible is this, what we're reading in Exodus 19, it's repeated over and over in different ways. Joshua, as he leads the people into the, the promised land, and he's departing, he says, if you forsake the Lord, he's reminding them, hey, you've heard this all your life. You're telling your kids this. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he's going to turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. See, from generation to generation in Israel's history, you heard over and over these words, obey my voice, keep my covenant. If you forsake the Lord, he's going to turn from you. That Be faithful to God, he'll be faithful to you. Forsake him, he's going to forsake you. Well, we're in a period of time of history in Daniel 1, where God has said, enough is enough. My patience has run out with you. You have forsaken me and if I'm going to be true to my promise, not just the good promises, but also my promise that I'm going to forsake you. If you forsake me, I've got to forsake you in this moment. And the problem with Israel in this time is they were worshiping other gods. They weren't just worshiping God. See, in addition to going to synagogue and offering sacrifices and so forth, uh, they were also uh, worshiping two particular gods that are of note to us this morning. And one was Baal. God of the weather. There's different types of bales, but this bale was God of the weather. Um, and there's a picture of uh, this bale who's holding a thunderbolt in his hand. He sends the rain. Why do you think that might be important to Israelites who are moving to a promised land that's flowing with milk and honey? It's because they use that land to grow crops. And so sometimes they might be, get a little bit anxious. There's not a lot of rain. 
I know God told us he's sending us to a land flowing with milk and honey, but you know what? It doesn't hurt to pray to another God, the God of the weather. Even though we were told not to worship foreign gods, let's just pray to them too. You know, double our chances of rain coming, I suppose. Well, and so if they have lots of rain, there's lots of crops, lots of crops is more money, right? So this, is the, this God of weather also can represent success and prosperity, can represent money. But there was another God, Asherah, who was the goddess of fertility. They started turning to this God as well. See, because the goddess of fertility made sure that their livestock would continue to be fertile and that they would have more and more livestock. If they wanted to have large families to grow the family business, you know, they would pursue Asherah the goddess of fertility. And the way they would pursue this goddess of fertility is through various sexual practices that I won't mention because the elementary kids are in the room with us this morning. Um, But the attraction of Baal and Asherah was money and sex. Now, thank God, since that time, our society has moved on from idols of money and sex, right? (laughs) We, We live in a country where the headlines all the time is the latest sexual scandal, the latest Ponzi scheme that was fanned out. You see, we don't worship, you know, these images of gods like the Israelites might have done, but without a doubt, from generation to generation, these idols have been passed down as well. And not just out there in the world in headlines, but in here, in this place, in this place, in my heart. I'm pointing to my heart. You know, we can cut corners in life. I know I'm going to church. I know I'm reading my Bible. But you know, if I compromise in sexual purity, it's okay. Jesus is going to forgive me anyway. If I handle my money and cut a little corner, you know, tax season's coming up. Not really that big of a deal. I mean, the government robs us anyway, right? Actually, we can't follow Jesus and still hold on to these things that God clearly condemns. You see, in Galatians, the Apostle Paul writes, Don't be deceived, God's not mocked. For whatever one sows, he also reaps. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. In Daniel 1, those first two verses, what we're reading about is the reaping of corruption. The Israelites have sown to the flesh For too long, they have compromised in too many ways. And one of the first lessons we learn, just in these first two verses with a little bit of history, is that a life without compromise worships Jesus alone. God calls his people from every generation to live a life without compromise. No excuses. And this is one of the main themes of this first chapter, is Are we compromising? Are we making compromises in our life? You see, for Israel, they still read the Torah. They went to synagogue and made sacrifices, but they thought it was okay just to make some little compromises here and there. But before you know it, there's a really severe judgment that came. They're kicked out of the promised land. They're exiled because they didn't see and worship God alone as enough. See, There's a better way that Jesus calls us to live life, and it's a life that's without compromise, without without challenging. But we have an example here this morning from four different guys that we're going to see how they live a life without compromise. Let's continue, go back to the story, and check out verse 3. It says, Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and nobility. So we're in verse 3 there. So royal family and nobility. So did the king go around and, you know, pick up the, the kids that you know, were homeless or were runaways. No, he, he went to the royal family, to the best family in Israel, to the nobility, used without blemish and of good appearance. They were good looking. They were skillful in, in all wisdom. They were smart. They endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. And they taught them literature and language of the Chaldeans. In verse 5, it says, The king assigned them a daily portion of food. He's giving them specific food that the king ate and the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were, here's the four guys, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah from the tribe of Judah. That's the southern kingdom that was just conquered. 
And verse 7 says, And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. They gave them new names. Check out their new names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. So let's just stop right there and enter into what's really happening here the best we can. You know, imagine you wake up tomorrow morning and you go to the gym at Planet Fitness and you see all the screens. If you've never been to Planet Fitness before, there's like all these different screens up there with six different channels. And on every channel, you see the same news. Russia invades America. We'll just pick like who we probably think is our greatest enemy right now. Russia. They invade America and overnight... The best and brightest teenage boys were shipped to Moscow. The ones who just received full scholarship letters to Ivy League schools, they were the ones that were handpicked. You're in Moscow now. The athletes that were trying to be recruited, who were being groomed for the next World Cup or the NFL draft, those teenage athletes, they're now in Moscow. The sons of the richest and famous and the most powerful American families are all gone. They're taken to a different culture, with a different language, with different food, with different customs that are all strange and, un and not understandable. They're given Russian uniforms to wear, and they sit in Russian classrooms, and they eat Russian food, and they, they're given a Russian name. You're no longer going to be called this, but you're going to be called this name now. These young teenage boys, they will never again go back to America. They'll never again see their family. They'll never end eat a Philly cheesesteak or a Chicago-style pizza. They're never going to speak English or have a need to speak English at least. And for three years, they're literally going to eat, drink, sleep Russian culture under the leadership of Putin. Why? Because the best and brightest of America are now be going to become the best and brightest of Russia, serving only Russia being Russians next political and civil leaders now that seems really far-fetched uh, we hope that will never happen in any country to any country by any country and it seems unimaginable and unrealistic to us but it was real for Israel so if we want to get into like how does that feel that's how that feels hey I want to ask a quick favor 14 to 18 year old guys in this church so this is probably the age range of Daniel and his buddies. Um, uh, if you're 14 to 18, I'm not going to embarrass you at all, but I, I'm going to ask you just to stand up in your seat. All right, so if you're 14 to 18, but you guys know who you are, I'm going to start calling your names. So don't make me embarrass you even more by calling your name, Liam. Um, uh, and then Jesse, James, okay? You guys are now standing up. 14 to 18-year-old guys. I'm not going to make you do anything or say anything. All right, thank you. He's beat red. All right. So... These are the guys that you would never see again in your life. They're going to leave their friends. They're going to leave their families. And they are going to be the leaders of another nation. They're never going to be on social media again. The hopes and dreams that they had for their future are now completely rewritten. It's whatever that country says it will be. Not what they want. You guys have no choice for your life anymore. Go ahead and sit down. Thanks. That's the age of Daniel and his buddies. This is absolutely devastating. Look at the verses that we just read. Look at the systematic deprogramization of what's happening. In verse 4, it says they're teaching them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. They're going to start to think and act like Babylonians. Verse 5, they're given portions of food. They're going to now eat like Babylonians. Verse 6, they're being renamed because they're going to now act and identify as a Babylonian. This like reminds me of Hunger Games type sci-fi weird crazy ownership of a young person's life. Now think about how those young men might feel. We grew up going to the synagogue. You know, a lot of these guys, they're here sitting in church. And these guys were part of synagogues. They were part of families that were teaching them. And we were told that our God is powerful. We were told that our God's in control. He seems to be pretty much a loser right now. Because my life is over. And my story, the future, is being rewritten. Some of them were probably angry at God. God, we were supposed to be the chosen people. And now I'm chosen by another country to serve another king who's not good. Which you'll see in later chapters about Nebuchadnezzar. See, Nebuchadnezzar is not just giving these guys a different life. He's saying, you're a different person. So much so, you have a new name. 
He's trying to completely erase who they are and create a new identity for them. In their identities, you see Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their names were all about, you know, about God and about serving and honoring God. But now these new names like Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they're all about serving moon gods and sun gods and, and gods that they don't worship. And the question here for us as we read this story that is really real is who are you going to identify with? Who do you want to identify? What God do you want to follow and belong to? You see, Daniel and his friends, they're faced with this choice. And it's not going to be easy to resist this. They're in exile. And we are not in exile in any way here in America. But we can feel that way sometimes, right? We can feel like we're not wanted as Christians. When's the last time you heard, you know, somebody join, a Christian join a civic organization and, we're, and then say, we're so glad a Christian's here. We're so glad this, there's representation from the church community on our board. Yeah, yeah, right. You guys are laughing. Because in America, Christianity is no longer really embraced. The values of the Bible are not sought after. And it seems like we live kind of in an exile where our book is like mocked and made fun of that we call holy and the words of God, where churches are not taken seriously. And it's partly our fault, but we feel sometimes like we're in a dark place like Daniel is in a dark place. There's nothing that is even similar in, in one regard in terms of what he's going through and experiencing emotionally. But there is a similarity in our experience in the worlds that we live in. See, just like Daniel's world now, in our world, they're saying, come to my school. Let me tell you what to believe. Look to me for everything and for all your needs is what the world says. But Jesus says, look to me. I'm all you need. I'm your Savior and your God. The world says, let me tell you who you should be. Follow this influencer, read this article, look at that blog, and then you'll find out what you should be. But Jesus says, let me tell you who you can be in Jesus Christ. The world says your God is dead, a loser, and powerless. But Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Even if you die, you will live. Just wait and see. And so the question is, as we continue in the story, who's going to define your identity? Is it going to be Jesus alone, or is it going to be the culture? We could be swept up into the culture, just like the Israelites were swept up into the culture of the foreign gods, and now you know, Daniel and his buddies find themselves in this new culture. Or are you going to be faithful to God? See, here's the second point that we, we come to in this passage already is a life without compromise, because that's what we're talking about. What does it mean to live a life without compromise? It finds our identity in Jesus alone. Who's defining your identity these days? Are you letting the culture do that for you? Are you taking the latest social media advice to find out what's most fulfilling? Are you looking to Jesus to say, this is the most fulfilling life to live? This is abundant life. He promises it, and so I'm going to take him at his word. I'm going to obey his commands, and I'm going to be who he calls me to be. See, a life without compromise worships Jesus alone and finds our identity in Jesus alone. And we have an example in this story of what does it look like to find your identity in God alone? You know, Jesus wasn't here in Daniel's life yet, and though we'll certainly see the connection to Jesus in a little bit, but we'll see how firmly rooted and his identity as the son of God he was, if we just keep reading. So look at verse 8. We go back to the story. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. And therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. So Daniel gets to the cafeteria. And the cafeteria that he's eating at is the same cafeteria that Nebuchadnezzar and the highest officials eat at. It's the same food. It's the same wine. He's now in school um, with all of his buddies. And pay attention. He doesn't say, I can't eat this food because of health reasons. I'm on a gluten-free diet. He doesn't say, you know, I'm starting, I'm diabetic. He's not going on a hunger strike to protest the war against Israel. What's his reason? I will not defile Myself. Defile means to pollute or stain our heart with unrighteousness. It's a very spiritual word. It's like his religious exemption request here. Like there's no, I don't want to do this. Like there, it'll, it'll defile me. 
It'll cause me to, to directly disobey God. Now you're like, well, why would eating the king's food cause him to directly disobey God? Well, because the food wasn't kosher. According to Jewish law, if you go back to Jewish law, the Torah, and the Old Testament, um, they were offering him unclean animals. And so unclean animals uh, were prohibited from being a part of your diet. And also unclean, they were unclean because they were slaughtered in a certain way. See, Babylonians, they were really practical people. You know, they would make a sacrifice with a certain animal, whether it was a clean or unclean animal. And then what they would do is they would take that sacrifice and we're not just going to throw that animal away. Let's now eat it. We'll, we'll make barbecue. And so now they're offering barbecue from these idol worshiping sacrifices in Babylonian. And Daniel's like, there's no way. I'm not eating any of that. And so I can't eat these foods. And additionally, to eat the king's food imply that Daniel's okay with the king and everything that he's doing. And he's like, I'm wanting to keep my distance from the Babylonian way. He remembered who he was. And so he wasn't going to be enticed by a simple meal. He was going to eat. And I see the slide's been up there for a little bit already. You're not staring at unclean meats, but you're staring at um, a, what is called the Daniel diet. Um, have you ever heard the Daniel diet or the Daniel fast? Raise your hand if you can. I have, unfortunately, and unfortunately, I've done it for the last three weeks. So uh, I did not do it in preparation for this series, um, but it's a 21-day fast from, uh, you know, meats and processed foods, sugar, uh, and uh, all, all you can eat really in this, what Daniel's doing is it's basically vegetables, fruits, and some whole grains. Um, and, you know, so basically I have to, completely changed my diet. I can't eat anything I used to eat and I have to eat. I do eat some fruits and vegetables um, because my wife uh, forced that upon me. But I've done the Daniel fast for the last three weeks. There's no way I'm doing it again. Um, and, and yet Dan my motivations were mixed. They were mixed to spiritual health benefits as well, you know, kind of like cleansing my body from all the sugars from the holidays and so forth uh, and, and getting back on track. And so I definitely had mixed motivations for doing the Daniel fast, but, but Daniel's motivation was not mixed. It was 100% spiritual. I am not going to defile myself. You can make me read your history books, but I know I'm rooted in who God tells me I am. That's not going to change that. You can call me what you want because I already know who I am before God. But he drew the line, when you tell me to disobey God, I'm not going to do it. And you might be thinking, like, you're just looking at this example, like, is this the best example that they can come up with? I mean, it's just, a, it's just some meat. You know, is it really that big of a deal? I mean, in, in our culture, like, is it really that big of a deal? We cut corners all the time on diets. You know, we have cheat days, we call them. You know, cheating, I thought, was a sin, but no, it's okay if you're on a diet. You have a cheat day. And, and Daniel's saying, there's no way I want to be wrapped up in this. And here it might, might be one of the most important things for you today to see why this is a big deal. Because Daniel realized his relationship with God touched every area of his life. Let me say that one more time. Daniel realized... His relationship with God touched every area. Your money, your possessions, your time, your relationships, even your diet. Everything is in submission to God. You know, we might say, what's the big deal about Daniel protesting in this way? I wonder if we are living a life without compromise, if people might be asking us more frequently, what's the big deal in our life? What's the big deal? Why would you not do that? What's the big deal? Why do you have to do that? See, for Daniel, there was no exception. There was no, nothing that was out of bounds for God to oversee in his life. And it's the third point that we come to in a life without compromise. If we want to live a life without compromise, a life that's faithful to God, we submit everything to Jesus. Not just the things that are easy and comfortable, but everything. This story, even though it's in a different time, transcends time. And when you think about this, and you think about the situation, the circumstances that Daniel finds himself in, if you're familiar with King Nebuchadnezzar and his power, which we'll talk about in later, in later messages as well, like, if you reject what Nebuchadnezzar tells you to do, most people die. And so for Daniel to say, I don't want to eat that food, like, that's a really small thing. Like, you're not going to eat my food. I'm not going to deal with you. Put him to death. You know, if we want to make excuses about cutting corners, about compromising things in our life, there's a lot of really good excuses Daniel could have here. He's going to be like, I don't want to look weird. We did this series called Weird back in the fall. You know, all the other Jewish boys, they're eating. But not Daniel. 
So maybe I should just join them. If I refuse this food, maybe I'll be uncooperative. And nobody wants to have an uncooperative person that there is in their school, right? Nobody wants that kid in their class. No teacher is like the uncooperative kid who is always asking for something different to be treated special. Daniel's like, if I want to get ahead, if I want to not be seen, like I just need to go along with things. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't compromise still. He could make an exception. He's 500 miles from his rabbi and his family that told them, that taught him about kosher food and not to eat unclean foods. They'll never know. He's never going to see them ever again in his life. There's so many good excuses that Daniel could have to just eat this meat, and it's not a big deal. Do you see how you can relate to these situations? If I teach this curriculum at school that's mandated and it goes against what I believe, like, if I don't do it, I'll get fired. You know, is it really that big of a deal to have a few drinks pretty frequently? Is it really a big deal to have a few looks at that website? It's not that big of a deal. In college, I was part of a fraternity, and um, part of making sure your fraternity lasted from semester to semester and didn't get kicked off campus is you need to do some good things. You need to do community service, and you need to do a couple different categories, and one of those categories was called brotherhood social events. And so brotherhood social events were events that assured the university that you weren't just doing stupid things as a fraternity or sorority. Uh, it means you were doing something that was beneficial, so you weren't allowed to have alcohol there, and you had to be doing some wholesome activity. And so, like, we would go out to dinners and so forth, and that would qualify us as long as we had a certain percentage of the guys there as a brotherhood social event. We could check that off the list. We need to do so many in a certain uh, semester and so forth. And the guys came up with an idea that fit the criteria for a brotherhood social event. Um, and when I came to the house that night, they ran it by me because I wasn't there for the brainstorming of the idea. They said, hey, Wolf, do you want to go with us to the next brotherhood social event, which is a strip club? And I said, no. And they knew I would say no. They would say, we've already thought about it. Well, if you, you, you don't, like, you, we're just looking, you know? We're just looking. I was like, no, I'm not going to just look. And it's like, how about we, like, just seat you in a way where you don't, you can look away. You could still be there, you know, because we've got to hit our quota. And you could be there. They wanted to make sure it was a good, fun brotherhood social event. I was like, no. What's the big deal, Wolf? Is anybody asking you? What's the big deal? Dude, you're weird. I know. <laughs> it's not that bad. It is. Because if you give sin an inch, it'll take a mile. That's the story of verses 1 and 2. King Jehoiakim is now under exile and all of Israel with him. Why? Because they just continued to say, oh, it's just, you know, we're just praying to the weather God. We still also believe in our God. But we're just... Two is better than one, right? No. It's not okay. I've called you, my chosen special children, to live a life without compromise. Daniel was all in with God. It says he resolved himself not to eat the food. It, it wasn't even like he thought about it. He already knew, like, I'm going to obey God. So he's in a situation where he's called to obey God, disobey God. And he's like, no, I've already resolved, like, years ago, when I went through confirmation or whatever, you know, bar mitzvah process it might have been for Daniel or whatever it might have been for you, maybe you resolved, no, I'm going to follow Jesus. And so when certain, certain things come up, like, do you want to go to a strip club? It's like, no, why would I ever even consider that? Why are we ever even considering some of the things that we do when we're called to clearly live a life without compromise? There was another man who is known for this word resolutions in his life. Um, he was the preacher in the 1700s named Jonathan Edwards. You might have heard his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that is much debated. Um, and that was later in his life that he gave that sermon. But at the age of 17, Jonathan Edwards started writing out what were called resolutions for his life. There were 70 total resolutions that he wrote within a short span of years, but they started when he was 17. I want to read these resolutions to you from a 17-year-old man, much like the guys that stood up earlier, where he writes, I will do whatever I think will be the most glory to the most, be most to the God's glory, excuse me, and my own good profit pleasure for as long as I live. And I will do these things without any consideration of the time that they take. I don't know that I can write that at the age that I am now. But he's writing like, I want to do whatever is to the most of God's glory. 
That's, that's his first resolution. He, he, a couple others that I cherry-picked. Another resolution. Never lose one moment of time, but to seize the time to use the most of it in a profitable way as I possibly can. Have you heard any 17-year-old boy ever say those words? I'm trying to use my time profitably today, mom and dad. As they're on the video games, right? No! But he's saying, this is a man who follows Jesus at 17 years old. He's resolved when I feel pain. Look at this one. To think of the pains of martyrdom, both of Jesus and of believers around the world, and remind myself of the reality of hell. Who thinks that way? Not just what age does somebody think that way. He's resolved never to do anything out of revenge. He's resolved never to speak evil of anyone, except if it is necessary for some good, real reason. And 65 other resolutions that he writes out. And I wonder if some of us today need to write some resolutions down. Not New Year's resolutions for the next year, but resolutions for our life. That when somebody picks up the phone and calls me and says, I need help, if I'm not doing anything, I get up and I help them. Because I'm resolved to serve others and live to serve others. That I am resolved with, to pursue fellowship with other believers. Because why? The Bible instructs that I will surround myself with other believers to grow in my spiritual life. I will not isolate myself. So I'm resolved to show up. When work says you need to work on Sunday or work says you need to work on this Wednesday night that you're supposed to gather with your believers, no. Like, can I have a religious exemption? This is an important time for me. See, people aren't thinking these ways these days anymore. I'm hearing way too much that I can't make it Sunday because of work. Did you ever consider to say, I can't work on this time? You see, that was normal for my generation growing up. Like, we just asked, and often it was granted. It's like, yeah, people just don't mess with that anymore. I wonder if you might find the same response if you just politely ask. You don't need to, like, go pick it in your workplace. You just ask very politely, hey, I would like to go to church. What other resolutions do you need in your life that aren't just for a new year, but are for life, to live a life without compromise? See, David was, or Daniel was already resolved to live this way. And check out what happens. Look at verse 9. We'll read the rest of the story. Because um, Daniel asked, hey, can I not eat this food? And so and God gave Daniel favor. Look at verse 9. He gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Now, if you're reading that, that doesn't sound very favorable or compassionate, does it? It's a no. He's saying, no, you can't pursue your own diet, Daniel, because he's scared for his own life. But then Daniel goes down the ladder. He doesn't go up the ladder. He goes down the ladder to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Test your servants. So he's, he's asking in a different way. He's saying, hey, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the ewes who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he's, saying, he's just saying like, hey, just give it, let us experiment. Let, give us a try. You don't have to make a commitment. Just give it a try. And do you see how polite he's being too, by the way? You can be polite as a Christian and ask for, you know, time off for a religious reason, or you can be polite in certain things. In verse 14, it says, so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. So he went for it. And then verse 15 says, at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were in better appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. Now, I don't know what kind of fruits and vegetables they were eating then. I did not gain weight in the Daniel fast. I did the opposite. I lost weight in the Daniel fast. But apparently, they gained weight. And I wonder if it was because it wasn't just themselves who were being, you know, obedient to God that was involved in this. But remember back up to verse 9. God gave them favor. Who loses weight on the diet that the food you just saw? Who, in, in 10 days, it's a noticeable difference they line the guys off, take your shirts off, let's see how you look. And it's a noticeable difference in 10 days that these guys who are on the Daniel fast vegan diet here are bigger. That has to be the work of God. There's no way that's just man. And in verse 16 it says, So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink, 
and gave them vegetables, and all of Daniel's buddies hated him from then on out, <laughs> right? Like, if I were, like, if I were one of those guys, I would hate Daniel. Like, come on, we just had the best food in the best, most powerful nation in the world, and now we're eating vegetables again. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Maybe you can't imagine fully submitting to God because it's just too hard. There's no way this is going to fly with my boss. My friends will think I'm crazy. I lack the self-control to do this. But have you ever thought that God might give you favor? But have you ever thought there's more than just you and me at play in this life, but there is a God who is working behind the scenes, who can do things beyond what we ask and imagine? The hand of God is very clearly at work in Daniel's life and still very clearly at work in the lives of his people who follow him today. The observation of people who fully submit their lives to Jesus is God often blesses them in remarkable ways. It's not a promise. If you follow me, you're going to have a happy life all the time. It doesn't mean everything's going to go your way. But to quote Jesus, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. To look at Daniel's example. And as we read on, look at verse 17 and 18, we see that God blessed these young men with great wisdom and insight and skill, and they finished their three-year program. So they're, they're, you know, they come with their caps and gowns on here, the, the completion of their program, and they're marched up in front of Nebuchadnezzar in verse 18 and verse 19, it says, and the king spoke with them. So he speaks with these guys. I don't know exactly if it's one-on-ones that he has or all of them together. But among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So there's a real f- quick fast forward here. You go from this really early story to fast forward three years later, okay? So we've, we bypassed three years of history here. We'll come back to some of the things that happened during that time. Um, and they are completed their program. And they are the top of the class. You ever wanted to be the valedictorian or the salutatorian or in the top ten? Well, these guys were. They were at the top of their class. But not that, just look at, not only that, look at verse 20. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, so he's asking them specific questions there, personally. He found them ten times better than everybody in his class. No. He found them ten times better, check this out, than all the magicians and enchanters that were already on the payroll for Babylonia. These guys who had only been three years That is the favor of God, to be 10 times better than these magicians and enchanters that have been doing this for years. Do you want to go deeper with God? Live a life without compromise. Do you want to know God more? Have people asking you, what's the big deal? Be fully committed to him. See, what they didn't say, what Daniel, Hananiah, uh, and, and these guys, his buddy, what they didn't say is they're like, you know what, it's only a three-year program. Let's just do what they're telling us to do, and we'll obey God later. But so often you hear that. I'll just wait till the kids grow up, and it's easier to get to church, and we'll go back to church. Or the kids are growing up. We should get them to church. Or, you know, I'll get to church at some point later. You know what, I'll give later once I get that promotion. You know, I'll start to read my Bible when things calm down in life. So I'll read it later. You know what a good word the devil uses for Christians? It's not never read your Bible. It's not never go to church. It's just do it later. Because later never happens. Now is the time. Today is the day to fully submit to Jesus. What are you waiting for? Because you'll just continue to say later when later comes. And you'll say later again. Surrender to Jesus today. And you might be asking, why do you keep talking about Jesus when we haven't even read his name in this story? And where is he at in this story? Well, Daniel is often called in, um, in Old Testament literature when there's certain Bible characters, they're called types. They point to Jesus or they foreshadow. They give you a taste of what is to come. And what Daniel points forward to Jesus is, is Jesus is the only person who lived a life without compromise. See, Daniel still messed up. We're not, I heard one pastor call them Dan Lillian, Danielians, you know, like as if we follow Daniel. You know, we're, I'm not telling you to be Daniel today. 
Daniel's not the hero of this story. The hero of this story is who Daniel's life points forward to. See, because in the same way Daniel was exiled, take out, taken out of his world into a foreign world, Jesus left heaven and came to our world. He came to earth, just like the exile that Daniel experienced. In the same way Daniel grew accustomed to things in that land, that Jesus became like us. He became a human being. He became tempted by sin. Remember, Daniel said, hey, test us in this. Jesus was tested. He was tested by religious leader after religious leader. He was tested by the devil um, in the desert after his fast. He was tested as he had to go to the cross. You know, Jesus lived not just a diet without compromise, but an entire life with no compromise. Daniel was not perfect, but Jesus was perfect. He was sinless in every way. And Daniel's life points forward to Jesus. Where is Jesus? Jesus is all over the book of Daniel, which we'll see every single week. We don't follow Daniel, but we follow a better Daniel. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is a savior who came to save us from the penalty of sin that we deserve. And the question is, are you submitting your life fully to him without compromise? Because Daniel's life foreshadows Jesus, but it also foreshadows what your life could look like. If you live in a land that's similar with exile, be faithful to him. God will give you favor. God will look after you. God is for us, and he is not against us. And so I want to invite you, maybe for the first time, to fully place your faith in Jesus Christ, to find your identity in him alone, to worship him and him alone, and to submit everything in your life to him. I want to invite some of us who you know you're cutting corners. You know, like, when you do this thing, you shouldn't be doing it, and you know when you're supposed to be doing that thing, you're not doing it. Like, live that way. Not because you have to. Not because Jesus is making you in order to earn salvation. That's the beautiful thing about being a Christian. Is like, the Old Testament covenant was based on a condition. Like, you be faithful to me, I'll be faithful to you. The new covenant is grace. You don't deserve my love, but you will freely get it. Even though time after time after time you turn away, I will still love you. Time after time you come back, I will still be for you. But at the same time, the better life is a life without compromise. So it's this tension of grace, but still being called to live a life without compromise. God will not be mocked. Do not be deceived. You will reap what you sow. Let's sow lives without compromise. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for uh, this example of Daniel that we read about, and thank you for the better Daniel that we worship, Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that in Jesus we can have abundant lives, we can have sins forgiven, we can have a personal relationship with you and know you fully. Lord, we want to thrive in that relationship with you, and that's why we're here this morning. And so, Lord, one of the ways we can do that is living lives without compromise in them. God, as we take communion right now, I pray and ask that you would bring to mind ways that we have compromised, that you would help us to repent of those ways, that you would change our hearts to be more fully submitted to you in this moment. God, I pray for anybody this morning who's not walking with you yet. I pray right now that you would speak to them, that you love them, that you sent Jesus for them, that they don't have to do these things in order to be good enough for your love and your favor because Jesus did that for them. Lord, may they fully surrender their lives to Jesus. God, I pray as we go through Daniel that we would see not just what it looks like for us to shine in darkness, but to see that Jesus did that for us to embrace that, to center our lives around that, and to never be moved. We ask that you would do this in our lives.